Hi patrons, uh, here is the uh, private video for this month. Uh, I have with me in this video Corey, the co-founder of Bitmeme Canon. Say hi Corey, let's test that one hey. out. Yeah, that How's seems, it going? Seems to be working well. And uh, there's a, a good reason that uh, he's here uh, with us for this video that I'll get into relatively soon. So uh, my apologies for being quiet on the Amiga end of things uh, for this month. A lot of stuff has been going on, but unfortunately a lot of it is stuff that I cannot yet talk about because it involves other people and their projects and deals either we're working on or that they're working on or just secret projects they're not ready to reveal yet. So I'm going to quickly uh, run down uh, those things in a general sense to just give you an, an idea of what we've been working on. Um, and then I'll get into more detail as soon as I possibly can for each of the specific things. And um, so the first thing, I have some notes written down to make sure I don't miss anything in particular. Uh, so for the big game that I think a lot of people care about that I'm working on with those veteran Amiga, classic Amiga developers, um, that game is still going very well. We're just kind of in hunker down and back into privacy mode to quite a degree. We're really trying to focus and very good progress is being made on two fronts. We're trying to focus on getting a near complete level one done uh, in order to really make a great splash for the official first public release or teaser, uh, sort of just publicity teaser for the game. And so a lot of work is going into that and has already been going on, but there's still quite a bit to go, but we're making good progress. And then the other cool thing on that end is the programmer has made really good strides to uh, sort of find and perfect the best uh, methodology possible to be able to get the game running, even though it's made to run extremely well on classic Amigas, uh, to be able to export it as effortlessly as possible with a very high quality end result onto other platforms like modern PCs and consoles and things like that. So we can hopefully, it'll, it'll definitely work. The exporting is already working, but the point is we're, we're really gonna try to make this game so high quality and so fun that it appeals to uh, the entire uh, gaming audience in general and especially people that like retro gamings in this genre of uh, beat-em-up game. Um, we're really hoping to draw a whole new audience of people uh, into uh, the Amiga community uh, to become Amiga fans. And uh, so that's also going very well. Uh, I, I can't wait to go into more detail about that because it's pretty exciting. Uh, what the uh, programmer has been able to pull off so far. And then, uh, so another thing that's been going on is uh, another longtime Amiga community member has been working on an excellent game project. I got to uh, see a private video of the, uh, the game as it currently stands. And it's not an arcade console style game, it's a really cool the best way I can describe it right now without uh, sort of um, betraying the, uh, the privacy of this person uh, is it's like a stra strategy slash exploration game that's kind of a fictionalized period piece game. Um, so very cool style, very high quality and he contacted me after seeing some of my videos and some of my art and uh, basically he's working out a deal with me to get me to help him um, finish up the art that he requires and in general polish up the art even more. It's already very high quality but uh, I'm going to help polish it up even more and uh, finish, finish up the remaining art required to finish the game. So I look forward to being able to uh, show that down the line once the actual developer is comfortable or ready to, uh, to to do the big reveal for the game publicly. Uh, and then, um, let's see, I've also been working with a few different people, uh, setting up tentative uh, agreements or scheduling to, for me to become, uh, or for me to be a guest on popular, first uh, very popular Amiga live stream. 
uh, and then just uh, retro gaming live streams in general. So I've been uh, making progress, uh, talking to the proper contacts, and making the uh, the uh, preliminary arrangements to make that happen. So that'll be uh, exciting too, and hopefully we'll just draw more attention and support for the projects and for the Amiga in general. So that's what's been going on. Uh, for, for those things that I can't talk about in great detail, and now the thing and the big reason Corey is, is here for this particular video is, uh, and luckily I think he'll be around much more often for, for these sorts of videos, is um, we discussed the idea before I was the only member of Bitbeam Canon that was specifically working on Amiga projects as well, and then we were working together on several other retro projects that weren't specifically Amiga, like the one you guys saw that is tentatively named Cyberjack that has the 8-bit eight Nintendo aesthetic and Corey is working on um, a really cool um, Sega Master System uh, styled retro game that's more of an overhead action adventure game um, somewhat similar to but with a very different uh, theme a more sci-fi theme uh, uh, sort of similar to, uh, to the great Zelda games um, and uh, so anyway, uh, we were discussing having Corey uh, help out on some of the Amiga projects and the first one that uh, he's going to be working with me on is the game that I will get running now on my screen. It's going to take a while because it's actually emulating the disk, the slow Amiga disk drive loading. But just to remind you guys of which project we're going to be working on. There we go. So this game here is what we're going to be working on. And so what we realized is that um, in this particular project that's being made in Amos on the Amiga, uh, most of the actual code is going to be done and is being done by Mike Ness, another great long time uh, Amiga um, member of the Amiga community. Uh, who's a much better programmer than I am. Um, but in the meantime, like he's working on some like real um, under the hood optimization stuff and getting a, a actual tile map display system uh, to work in a really optimized manner. And so instead of uh, creating a bottleneck where things slow down in development for this, Corey and I can work on like front load and make as much of the art as possible ahead of time and simultaneously uh, I'm very fast with a, a great authoring system a modern authoring system for m sort of modern platforms called Construct2 which you've seen before you may have seen before in past live streams and that's what we were making those other retro style games with uh, uh, I don't know if I just mentioned it but it's called Construct uh, or specifically Construct2 or Construct3 we're going to be using Construct2 uh, to get this project uh, uh, going but so we're going to create very quickly we're going to recreate this game on Construct for modern platforms and and that way we can perfect how the game like perfect the gameplay uh, figure out exactly what art we need and just get everything working and then so that way we'll sort of have a um, a perfect design guide for myself and Mike Ness to uh, to make the Amiga the actual Amiga version uh, perfectly mimic the uh, the uh, the version made with Construct and we're going to take our time and I'm going to be explaining to Corey the actual really specific technical and color constraints that we have to work with so we'll actually be making the real Amiga graphics for the Amiga version as we develop sort of um, uh, before the Amiga version we develop the or it's not exactly before because we're not we're not putting the Amiga version on hold the Amiga version will actually get done faster this way because we're front-loading the art creation and perfecting the game design and then it's just a matter of 
then when we're ready to code we've got all the art and all the design all ready to go and it's just a matter of um, and then that way uh, Mike Ness he can see exactly how it's supposed to behave and then just program it accordingly so this is the project we're going to be working on and it's um, I wanted to explain to everyone also that uh, this gameplay on the first version of this game is going to be uh, very simple but hopefully quite fun and addictive uh, but we really want to be able to deliver our first finished game as quickly as possible both on the um, like non Amiga side just retro games in general but also on the Amiga end and um, so this is the general gameplay there's this old game uh, for the uh, Sega Master System called Black Belt um, and it had a really simple premise to the gameplay as is typically the case you're walking from left to right and enemies come quickly from the both sides of the screen and uh, you just have to very carefully you have to have really good uh, twitch reaction time and you have to uh, sort of choreograph within a split second how many attacks you're going to be doing and at what timing in front of you and behind you when you're going to turn um, and then there are going to be as you probably saw while I was talking there are objects that fly very quickly overhead that you have to do a high jump to grab that will replenish your health or give you temporary invulnerability or enhanced uh, like magic powers or attack powers and so I'm, I'm and, and one thing, go ahead, Corey. Uh, yep. Just wanted to mention, you yep. know, in this game, you know, obviously the guy's just kind of punching and kicking, and mm -hmm. um, but you've got this kind of like a little fireball coming out of the guy's yep. hand, right? And you plan on like kind of keeping it that way, right? Like so, the the, right. the guy's got a little distance on him, uh, right? And, and there's that, going that's cool, yeah. yeah. And there's going to be like several different power ups. The the premise, the the sort of plot to the game not in a story sense but sort of the way the gameplay mechanic works is this is like a medieval style warrior who ends up um, getting this magic gauntlet or maybe two magic gauntlets so he's like uh, whereas most games like Castlevania the characters tend to be uh, slender sleek elegant uh, pretty boy heroes with a whip or a sword this is like a big bruiser guy who actually just punches the crap out of things with metal gloves <laughs> and <Nice. laughs> and he gets magical ones so it's going to be much more bruiser based he's going to like really slam enemies and maybe we'll make make them go flying into one another uh, fun stuff like that um cool so there will be these different power-ups you can get for these gloves some of them will increase the attack range you know some might be fire based some might be explosive based so that when you hit something there could be a delay. So imagine you hit an enemy, and they're glowing, and they go flying back, and then oh, they explode. Oh, this guy explode. does have a little fireball, doesn't he? Yeah, just yeah, a very small one. It, it's sort of yeah. like, yeah, is it like a motion blur, or just a, like, is it supposed to be a fireball, or what? You, you know, it's not... Yeah, it doesn't seem... Uh, yeah. Oh, I think that's like just an effect. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, when he, when he does the impact. Okay, but I, it I could it also But it could also very well be... That that is, I'm pretty sure if we slow it down, you're right. I think I think that effect comes out even if there's no uh, connection on this right. level. And I think they might actually be using that sprite for the collision detection of the attack. Right. Mm. So instead of using yeah. the collision boxes, does that little fireball type effect hit the? I, I'm not positive, but that could be the case. But that's that's sort of what I'm doing. Like it. it it always generates something right in front of them and depending mm -hmm. on what power up you get that something will be different and the effect on the enemy will be different so sometimes right. you might get a long range attack and then the other thing that I plan on adding uh, that'll make it more sophisticated in later levels of this game there are things like falcons and stuff that can uh, that fly overhead and so there's going to be enemies overhead kind of like altered beasts that you have to worry about so conceptually picture combining this game with altered beast the other thing i was going to point out is in this game in, in black belt you have this separate uh type of gameplay where the characters are bigger and it's more street fighter that's something that i'd like to do if the game does well um you know if, if people like the game the first version of the game 
I plan on making without this sort of second gameplay style and just having cool big bosses and sort of boss sequences within the usual scale. That way we don't have to program a whole other, whole other type of gameplay and, and we as the artists don't have to create a whole bunch of additional art for the character and the bosses at a larger scale and environment art at a larger scale. Um, so keep it lean and mean, fun, addictive gameplay that's uh, the right balance of challenging but reasonable and just make it a little more sophisticated to what you see here. So that's like what you just saw was like a sub-boss, uh, an enemy that takes more than one hit to destroy, that has uh, maybe projectile weapons or just a longer range attack. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, um, when when I, you were showing me this game before, you know, it's like I saw a little bit of the early stuff, but it seems like as it goes, they really do add a lot of variety to the... Uh, right. The, the enemies, the way they come in, the different types of things they do, and like I do right. think this style of game has a lot of potential in terms right. of you know you do a lot of imaginative things right um, that they're clearly I mean yeah. you know and this there's a falcon yeah. obviously we wouldn't have to be this limited because right exactly you know, this was the the master system but yeah yeah I, I can appreciate the yeah. uh, and you'd be surprised. The my, franticness of it, yeah. My brother and I bought this game when it was new, and uh, we played the heck out of this game. It's simple, but very addictive. And as I mentioned to Corey before we started recording this video, the gameplay is like a cross between an action game and a rhythm action game. Like, you really get into a rhythm, and you're seeing the enemies, just like with music rhythm games, where you see the musical note you're going to have to hit at a certain time like mm -hmm. you're seeing the enemies come from left right and above and each one is coming at a different speed so you're constantly it's not just about tw twitch reaction time it's like you're saying okay there's three guys spaced out this way coming from the front and then two guys spaced out this way coming from the back and then like you have to sort of instantaneously analyze all of their relative speeds and which ones are going to come first and so you're attacking like Front attack, front attack, turn, back attack, turn back around, front attack. Like, it's all <laughs> happening really quickly in your mind. So it's yeah. like, it's got this really fun, frantic feeling that makes it, even though it's simple, it's, you know, like the, the quintessential, that cliche of how to make a, a, a successful and popular game. It's easy to pick up, hard to master, right? Right, yeah. And that's exactly the sort of simple gameplay that's deceptively simple and really addictive and that's what we're going to go for for this game. And the other cool thing is this game is like the first step in a franchise that we call a Castlevania beater franchise. So it'll start really simple with this first version of the game. Then we might add the bigger Street Fighter bosses if the game does well. And then we can reuse the same art and the same engine and make it into a full on uh, um, Metroidvania uh, exploration game where now there's much more complicated maps. Like you can see in this game, you're always work walking on a perfectly flat, always walking from left to right, always on a perfectly flat surface. And for the first version of the game, I plan on mimicking that, keeping things really simple. It's just a fast rhythm action game with a lot of fun, with a sort of Castlevania-esque theme, but with a more brutish brawler kind of character. And then, but we can expand on that with the same art and the same character, but then just like with the Castlevania series, we plan on making other games that will expand on the history of that world. And it might be, you know, now you're the great grandson of this character and all of that sort of stuff. So um, that's what we have planned. So the uh, we're not going to do any art in this particular um, uh, private video. But we are going to actually show you step by step. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching, I've been teaching Corey how to use Construct2 to make games while we were working on his really cool um, a sort of uh, action adventure game project, which, uh, which we'll be able to show you in later, uh, later private videos once we're ready to do that. But anyway, to make that game, I've been also teaching Corey Construct. We've been doing Skype sessions with screen share and I've been showing them how to use construct but that's an overhead game uh, so in this case I'm going to show him how you would go about making a side-scrolling game in construct uh, right from scratch and you're gonna see 
maybe that maybe the entire proce process of making this game maybe we'll make this a regular um, like a private uh, video uh, like while we work on the game that's possible we'll see how that goes but at least occasionally we'll be catching you up on the progress of of the non amiga version of the game so you can see the new art and you can see the gameplay design and provide feedback if you so wish uh, so that's how that's going right now and in a second we're going to uh, actually load up construct and start making the game work i prepared all of the art ahead of time converting it from amiga iff format to png so we can use it in construct so okay so i am going to uh, open up construct 2 and we're going to start a new project there we go and then we are going to go up here and choose a new and we're going to choose new retro style project and what that is going to do is it's going to preset it to a low resolution but we're going to change it to a specific resolution the same resolution that we're using for um, and I did write it down somewhere but of course like an idiot I think I may have lost it so hold on a second uh, let's see Uh, I'll find it but anyway uh, the point is like there, there's a resolution we picked that is good low resolution retro but it makes it widescreen so that we can fit on um, on uh, when we export the game for tablets and iPhones and stuff that it fits the widescreen format much better but then we crop in with interface and with room for the touch control pads and buttons we crop in so the actual game part of it stays the proper non-widescreen -wide Amiga resolution in this case. And then there's there'll be nice interface on the side with the room for touch controls and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so eventually I need to remember what that resolution is, but it, it like I can switch to that at any time. So it's not a big deal if I can't find where I scribbled that on one of my million sheets of paper. So um, I can get back to that at any time. So, but anyway, in order to, uh, so what happens when you set it to be a retro project is it makes it pixel art friendly and it gives you uh, a small original window size that you can then uh, tweak however you need. So if I click on the project itself, uh, the important thing, so you'll see it's 320 by 180, uh, which is, fairly close to a typical classic console resolution. Um, you Amiga people will remember 320 wide is standard low res width, uh, but usually we have at least 200 in screen height for uh, classic Amiga. I think it was pretty much the same for the Mega Drive slash Genes Genesis. Uh, but here's the important stuff for retro. We have, um, uh, where is it? Uh, sampling point that means it's not going to do filtering and add a million colors you're going to keep those perfect pixels and uh, the other really important thing is pixel rounding so this is a modern engine that usually when you're doing movement of a sprite or scrolling it would actually move in sub pixel coordinates and it would be using filtering to create the illusion of a super smooth scroll or movement that's not bound to the actual pixel size. And actually you certainly don't want that for an actual pixel art game because then there's no way to have clean actual pixels or if there is, it's gonna look really weird and jumpy. So um, let's see, uh, we're gonna make the orientation, force it to landscape. And then the other settings are far less important. Uh, for what we're doing for this uh, session of uh, creating the the uh, so we're just we're not going to worry with like a title screen and menus we're going to dive right into the actual gameplay element of the game so uh, yeah because you yeah. can uh, you can always you know based on these layouts you can always right. uh, build that later and then make that the start and then just jump right. to any layout based right. on the yeah, I can just up, I can so, just add yeah. layouts and event sheets and reorder them however I want, and you know you can cool, control yeah. you can control what 
at what point the game goes from what layout to what layout. So you can just sort of start in a haphazard way and dive right into gameplay and worry about the uh, stuff like menus and all of that later on. Um, so And that's what we're going to do today. So uh, first I'm just going to start by renaming this layout uh, to, um, let's see, level layers. And that is because I'm, we're going to be making a lot of layers, including the HUD layer. And we're going to make those layers universal. So this, this, it's going to start out being a sort of test level where we perfect the code and where we bring in all the graphics. But um, this won't be an actual finished level of the game. This will, this will include the universal layers that we're going to be using in all the levels of the game, like the HUD layer and that side interface and touch controls and stuff that I mentioned earlier. So. So I just called that level layers and then so now we can go into the layers tab here and you'll see there's a layer zero. We're just going to start adding to this and we're going to be carefully naming these. So I'll create a few uh, to begin with. So this topmost one we will call HUD and we will make it a, um, uh, we're going to set the parallax to zero, meaning it never scrolls. So anything we put right here in the upper left corner in that particular layer, uh, it will never scroll, which, uh, which is obviously perfect for the HUD. All right, so, and then even right now I can just start, I can double click and I can just create a standard construct sprite. And then I'm going to load in, uh, I already saved out the graphics that we need to get started. So there's just a placeholder uh, HUD element and I'm going to set its uh, origin point to top left to make it really easy to place and then that informs of informs us of the actual uh, screen width of the Amiga screen uh, in a visual way so there's that and then uh, that's all we need for the HUD right now so I'm going to lock that layer and then we're going to need a foreground layer so this is the actual playable area of the game. And so we want the uh, parallax rate to be 100%. That's great. And then this layer will be the background layer. Uh, so we'll name that BG. And I also have already preset up a background image, which is uh, taken right from the Amiga version. And of course, in the Amiga version of the game, I used the, the uh, copper color changing trick but I had to just sort of hand bake those color changes into the art uh, since there's no copper color changes on a, in Construct for modern system, uh, modern systems which don't use indexed color mode or anything like that. So I'm going to add another sprite and just load up that background image. And uh, speaking of that, yeah. um, go ahead. Uh, you know, I know Construct will deal with graphics in terms of 24-bit color or 32-bit, right. you know, uh, like, are there any at all, like, modern uh, development kits or software that, that actually does <laughs> deal with, like, index colors? And yes. Like that? Uh, yeah, none of the, um, like, easy game development systems that artists like us would probably be interested in. But things like there, there's an authoring system, like a suite, like an, yeah, a sort of suite of libraries and stuff like that called QT, which is like a cross-platform development system. Oh, okay. And that does have indexed color support, uh, even though it's for modern systems. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe SDL does too, but that's a complete guess. I could be wrong. And the reason I, mean, I think I, that is because the original SDL, you could develop Amiga games for it, so it must have index color support. Yeah, uh, I mean, I know, I know you can generally fake anything that you right. want to pull off. Um, right. But it, you know, it, like, I've always like kind of had that desire to. Uh, yeah. To really, you know, it is cool to do things like the color cycling and right, exactly. color swapping and things like that uh, on the fly yeah. that. 
you know, when you have to fake those things, you yeah. end up using a lot more graphics and so far the easiest than you, than you want to. Right, but. exactly. So far, the easiest way I know of of doing that is actually Amos on an emulated Amiga. Nice. Because then you can do color cycling, you could do on the fly palette changes, and it's not that bad, especially if you have a more skilled real programmer helping you, like I have with Mike Ness for this project, for the real Amiga version. Then, uh, like that, of course, when you have a team and a real programmer, that's the best of both worlds. The artist can focus more on the art. If there's a game designer, they can focus on that, and the programmer makes it all happen. And so you just end up. I, I do better. feel like you know. I mean, you know, the Amos seems to be you know, of course, just Amiga related. It, right. It, it seems to me like that presents a sort of golden opportunity for someone to actually create the ultimate sort of retro game engine yeah that, that does support like all the all the retro systems or as many as possible right well um, that's one of the things i'm really like hoping to do is like yeah, yeah we're cool. we're going to make this game engine the real amiga amos version we're going to make it available for anyone to use so, right. like, I really want to eventually attract all kinds of, like, the, you know, our great other pixel artist friends and, and retro game developers. Once we have a full engine that they can just swap out the art and level design and tweak the code, and we make that easy for them. And then we also prove the fact that if you make a game on the Amiga, nowadays, you know, you can use tricks like open source emulation to not just sell it to just that relatively small Amiga community, uh, but you can also sort of wrap the game in emulation and sell it on modern platforms as well. So if we can prove that point, just, just like how you and, and me, like real like uh, hardcore pixel artists, we love messing with that stuff and seeing what cool effects we can get dealing with yeah. real index color mode and palette swaps and color cycling and all that stuff. And there's a lot of really good uh, pixel artists out there that are itching for that kind of chance. And so if we can make it really appealing and attractive and sort of flake proof for them, say, hey, look, there's no chance that the programmer is going to disappear. Like the game engine is already done. Like you right. have that, you can just come in and we'll make like tutorial videos for how to replace out the art and stuff like that and just make it so like you do your art thing and you you know you work with a musician and stuff like that and you can just um you know have a um make a truly legit retro game that you can also sell on modern things and you can scratch that itch as like a hardcore pixel artist and have like real bragging rights that the game actually runs on like 30 year old computers uh, but anyway, so let's get back into this. Uh, we don't want to keep uh, the uh, patrons up all night watching this video either. So, um, sure. So uh, let's see. So the back layer should also, in this case, um, I think I do actually. I'll have to look back at the Amiga version uh, to verify. But for now, we're going to also give it. Uh, wait a minute. Back layer. We're also going to give it a zero parallaxing. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so I think I did give it, because the mountain strip is actually a blitter object, and I think I do, I, I really don't remember anymore. But for now, we're going to make it not scroll um, either. And then so now we're yeah, ready. Yeah, I think it was, from what I remember, it was, it was static. Still, it wasn't yeah, like I think so place. too. Yeah. Okay, so now, and it's really important, save frequently. So save as single file is what I tend to do. And then, oh, that's good. It's right in the proper folder. So we're going to call this uh, Barbarian. And we don't have a working title for this project yet. So um, Gauntlet Basher Boy. That's, uh, <laughs> that'll be the working title. All right, so we're going to save that out just to, uh, you know, in case I have a crash or something. And then, uh, so now I'm in the foreground layer. I've locked the background layer since we got what we needed in there. And so now the important first thing uh, for the foreground layer, just because I'm an artist, I like to keep things pretty as I go. I'm actually going to add a tile map object. And we're going to load in the uh, actual tile set that I made for this game. And we're going to close that. And those tiles are 16 by 16 pixels, so I have to adjust that. 
and then I can go right here and I can load in right out of promotion ng I was able to save out the actual um, uh, level uh, map which is currently only two screens wide but it gets it gets done what we need to once uh, Mike Ness gets the real tile loading in, we'll be able to make the level as long as we want um, so now we have um, and yeah so I'm going to have to um, perfect the positioning of this and we're going to get the um, the touch interface that's going to be its own layer as well but now we have a working foreground layer visually uh, back layer and HUD all in proper Z order uh, so now that I saved I can just click the save icon up there or control S to save which I do incessantly I think I told you I was traumatized in my teens working on Amiga graphics and my dad would work on uh, just be doing something and be messing with the circuit breaker uh, so the, you know the what is it called the circuit box or whatever the why can't I think of the proper word um, the fuse box right without warning me and I'd be just working on something you know once or twice I had been working on something for like an hour or something and then boop power power just went out because my dad didn't warn me he was going to be messing with the fuse box Mm. So, uh, like, I just became, like, upset, like, I save every few seconds. Like, I, I make one change and I save. Uh, but anyway, and version control, everyone, super important. Make sure you use something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Google Drive or, or what is the other one that's very popular, Dropbox or something like that. So you can revert back, like if you if you somehow corrupt a uh, project file, you can always revert back to older versions, older saves. It's uh, I've seen so many on the forums of Construct and Multimedia Fusion and stuff like that in real programming languages. Every year you'll see at least one person that was you know they have this desperate, please help. I've I've been working on this project for a year and a half, and now the project file won't load. And like they've, I've seen so many people lose like a year's worth of work because they just kept saving over one file locally without backing it up. And there's, there's no excuse for that, people. Like, you know. I mean, even if you're gonna do that, you you at least gotta like bake up. Yes, it exactly. So often, yeah, know? like save uh, off on a different, like on a CD, burn a CD, or somewhere, uh, make a backup saves every once in a while on a different, different location, different file name at the very least. Like it's already yeah. a risk, even if you save it under a different file. If that particular hard drive dies or your computer gets stolen, you're still screwed. So uh, yeah, version control really important. Uh, I have a feeling most of the patron backers already know that, but just in case someone else sees that or someone else is thinking about getting into development and they never did, first thing you should do is Google version control and open up a, an account on something like Dropbox. So that when you're saving your pro your progress, you can always revert back. And if your computer gets stolen or destroyed, you log back in, and all your files are still there, ready to go. Uh, so anyway, um, so now we're going to get to the more fun stuff. And before bringing the character in, we have to set up a floor f so that he won't just uh, fall into oblivion. And so I'm going to just create a very small um, repeating, um, so we'll make it uh, pretty much red. I'm going to flood fill that. Oh, I have got alpha set. No, that should, uh, is it 250? There we go. All right, so this is just a repeating background type image uh, object, but we can use it for collisions. And we can basically turn it into a solid object and align it with the foreground like so and this way the player will know where the, where to land so what, now that we've created this we'll just call this floor uh, collision or collide that's fine um, and then we are going to make it if you look right here initial visibility invisible so when the game runs you won't see that okay and then um, the other thing we need to do is we need to go into its behaviors and we're going to add solid. 
and now we're going to create a sprite that is just going to be a solid box and I don't remember exactly what the size should be so I'll just guess and say like 24 pixels wide and maybe 48 pixels tall and we're going to flood fill this a recognizable color for the player and the important thing one of the important things is we're going to put its origin point on the bottom center and we're going to make sure its collision uh, shape is a perfect rectangle and so now, yeah, that's eh, it's about right. It's a little too big, but that's fine. I can even just uh, shrink it like this now, but it won't be pixel perfect. Um, like it won't be exact pixels, but not that that matters. This is also going to be something that is going to be, we're going to call this player box. And we are going to give this the behavior known as... Uh, uh, ironically, it's called platform, even though it should be called platformer, but uh, I think I just missed it somehow. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's right. Oh, okay. Here it is. Platform. All right. So now you can see this behavior it has a whole bunch of pre uh, predefined settings that um, allow you to affect the physics like how fast does it move how fast and high does it jump and fall whether or not it can double jump and all that stuff and then default controls we're gonna for now we're gonna leave default controls on but we're eventually gonna switch to our own custom movement engine uh, or I should say input engine uh, so but that's it to get started so now, oh, and uh, we're keeping it visible for now so we can see what's going on. And I will make it a little smaller ahead of time just for the hell of it. But now already, you'll see, if we look in our event sheet, we currently have no code, so to speak. We have no events. But if we run this layout, we should have the background. Hold on. Uh, oh. Oh, there you go. Wow, look how high he jumps. So the physics are, the preset physics are for a high-resolution modern game, and this is a retro game. So he moves way too fast and jumps way too high, but that's simply a matter of tweaking those numbers. And right now we don't see any scrolling, but all we have to do, I might as well close this. We're done looking at the uh, black belt on the Sega Master System. So I'm going to close this. And so now we are going to... Uh, go back in here and I'll just really quickly tone down this movement to something like 120, 120, 120. Jump strength that needs to be much lower, we'll just guess. Uh, gravity maybe we'll do something like 400. Max full speed we'll do something like 400. Uh, and then the other important thing, we're going to give the player box another behavior and that is called scroll to I think scroll to and what that does now the whole game level will automatically keep the camera so to speak centered on the player uh, so that's eventually we might create a separate sprite and give it scroll to so that we can do fancier kind of slightly elastic scrolling oh, so now the jump is way too weak compared to the gravity the horizontal movement is closer, but now we've got too much uh, inertia. Like I let go of the walking key and the character slides a lot. So I definitely need to tweak those. Oh, jump strength, that was supposed to be 200 and I made it um, 20 accidentally. So that explains that. And then the acceleration and deceleration apparently have to be much faster. So I'm gonna make it something very high. Um, and then we can just quickly test that. But as you saw, the scrolling was working. Of course, we've got an issue with the layout is so big that it uh, we can see that bottom there that we shouldn't. So, but that's very easy to fix. We'll do that next. But this is starting to uh, starting to feel right. And of course, it looks a little weird because we've got the white border uh, on the sides. But we're going to cover that up with the touch interface screen later. Um, but as you can see, pretty easy to get things going in uh, Construct. So now we are going to fix that scrolling issue. And we only want 
a few pixels, some, something like 16 pixels of vertical movement. So what we need to do is take the, um, and, and we'll have to retweak things, these once I remind myself, once I found where I wrote down the actual screen resolution we want for this, um, or the window size that we want for this, uh, base, which is the same of, as Cyberjack and the other game. But, uh, all right, so what was I doing? Yeah, the scrolling, which is the lay, the layer, uh, not layers, the project, uh, the layer, those are its properties, and you see its height is currently massive, and we want that to be more like 200 pixels. Um, and uh, so that's gonna make it a lot better. It's still, uh, for the sake of it looking right right now, I'll make it something more like 180 or one, we'll say 190. Now we'll do 196, because I think the screen height is actually 180, right, if I recall. Uh, so, oops, that was supposed to be a six. You still there, Corey? Yeah, I'm here. All right, awesome. All right, so, and then the width doesn't matter so much. Um, all right, so that's fine. They'll just be, you know, you'll just be able to walk into a white void uh, for now until I enlarge the, uh, the tile map. Okay, so that's much closer. And we've got that vertical movement that we want. And I won't fall to, uh, into oblivion because that red thing that's invisible goes across the whole width of the level. Uh, but yeah, so that's all working. All right. And so now what we're going to do... Uh, all right, apparently I already saved recently. Um, let's just really quickly, just so it's a little more... Uh, appealing visually, even though this will be placeholder. We'll go back into layers, and um, we're gonna add another layer on top of everything, and we're gonna call this one uh, Touch Overlay. And this is going to have both the borders for the sides, and then eventually the touch buttons for touch control for tablets. Um, so for now, all we're gonna do is make sure that this is the unlocked layer that we have selected. So if we create anything on it, it goes there. And I am just going to, for now, use a uh, tiled background object, which is the same thing I used to make that red floor. And in this case, I'm going to, to not waste memory, I'm going to make it 16 by 16 pixel and just flood fill that with, we'll just do, uh, we'll make it a kind of gray color for now so it's not pitch black. Um, there we go. And then it starts out huge because the default stuff tends to be for modern high-res games in Construct. But it does work really well, as you all know, with us, our experience from Cyberjack. It works very well for creating um, uh, retro-style games as well. And uh, so that's it. So we have those on each side. So now when we run the game, we won't see that annoying uh, white background there. Oh, I forgot to set it scrolling to zero for this layer. So watch what happens. It's going to scroll off the... <laughs> <laughs> so, oopsie. I'm sure at least one patron was yelling at me. You idiot. You need to set the parallax to, uh, to zero. Uh, there we go. So there's that. And then, oh, I was so tempted to save. I'll try to not be so, uh, uh, what's the word, neurotic about it. Uh, there we go. So now we'll just do a, a quick tweak. Let's see. I'm just going to also add, we're going to clone this. Oh, maybe I don't have to clone it. Let me see. If I change the size of this one, yeah, it does not adversely affect that one. That's great. So I can just literally create a regular copy or instance of it. And then something about like there, we'll just make a gray bottom border as well for now, just to hide the fact that it's not, uh, you know, because I don't have the resolution set properly yet for the window. Uh -huh. So there we go. Nice. OK. 
Okay, so now, oh, I forgot there is a foreground layer. I forgot all about it, like a like an extreme foreground layer. I forgot oh, how many yeah. layers yeah, of parallax bottom. I managed to get on the uh, classic Amiga with Amos. And, uh, I'm humble bragging. Uh, <laughs> so now we're going to go to the foreground layer. We're going to add a layer. Oh, I guess we'll just drag it down there. And we're going to call this layer FFG. And this has to have a scrolling speed faster, both horizontally and vertically. So we're going to make it something like 140 in the X, and I'm going to make it a little less severe, which is cheating, but it, it might be something like this on the Amiga version 2, I don't remember. But we'll make it about 120 for the vertical, because I don't want it to like fly off screen vertically. Um, uh, but anyway, so now I'm going to create a tiled background object because this is a repeating pattern. And I'm going to load up my FFG image. And one thing that I will need to do, I forgot about this, I'm going to add to the height of this. Let's see if there's an easy way to do this. Resize. And I'm going to add, and we're going to align top left, and I'm going to add another we'll just say 40 pixels to be, we'll make it 40 to be safe. And then I think this is pure black, but I'm not positive. So I'm just gonna use the color picker to select this color. Maybe it's a really dark green, I'm not sure. And then we're going to flood fill to that same color. But now what we need to do is use the selection tool and we're going to erase out at least one pixel at the bottom. And the reason we're doing this is because this uses modern technology designed for 3D hardware and uh, like, um, what is it, uh, like texture UVs and stuff, like we'll get a little tiny blurry dark seam at the top where it's supposed to be transparent if this black goes all the way to the bottom. So by having that one pixel of completely transparent at the bottom, that eliminates that concern. So, and there it is, filling it in that big giant box. And then we just adjust it to something like this. And we need to spread it out wider than the actual level since it's gonna scroll faster. And then we're gonna have to perfect its position relative to the foreground by eye. But we'll try it like this for now and see what happens. So this is going to be in front of the player. And we're also going to add a tree sprite, which Unfortunately, I don't think I saved out the tree sprite, so I'm going to lower it a little bit. It's too high, but this is looking extremely similar to the Amiga version already. I think it needs to scroll a tiny bit faster uh, horizontally and vertically, so I'll just quickly tweak that. Um, so I'm going to move it down a little bit. And I'm going to. And is this, um, yep, you know, on the actual Amiga version, this this little foreground section, right? Is that similar to sort of like how the like a like a is it um, sort of like the screen slicing effect that old consoles that's what could I was, do? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Only with the Amiga and with Amos, with the with the Amiga and hardware banging, you can slice a screen into moving at different speeds. But with Amos, you don't have that directly unless you're like a really like high level programmer and you're willing to dive in and do like assembly or C code. Like like you can incorporate some C or assembly code into Amos, I think, if you really know what you're doing. But for just a general using the basic commands, you don't have access to that. But what you do have access to <coughs> is separate screens. Each screen just has to take up an entire um, vertical section of the screen you know what i mean it has to go across mm -hmm. the whole screen but that's what i did so the hud is one screen and then the playable area is another screen and then that foreground extreme foreground is another screen and then to make it seem more than just like the grass at the bottom i have a tree made out of sprites that i also display so we're going to get right. we're going to get that in there as well um and we just synchronize the position of the tree that sprites with that screen so it looks like it's attached to, to the same layer. Um, so it's really the same concept, it's just kind of called a different thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it is technically doing something a little different under the hood, but it, right. even hardware-wise, it's using the same sort of stuff. Um, right. 
but yeah so uh, all right so that I did need to tweak these numbers so we're gonna make it a full 150 and 130 and that'll be good enough and so now I'm going to add a sprite and this is going to be a placeholder tree so that's really big already I'll just draw it in there um, Oh, I do know the width should be presumably 32 pixels, so I can at least do that. 32, width 32, so I know what to fill. And then, yeah, that's way too tall, but uh, let's see, how tall should it be? Probably something like, uh, the whole screen height is 180 currently, so we'll do it like 110. All right, so I'm going to just quickly make a placeholder tree until I can convert the actual Amiga uh, tree. So this is going to be an absolutely terrible tree, but it's going to get the point across. Yes, folks, I am a professional pixel artist, and I didn't remember to taper the tree like a cone. Um, there's that, and then we're just going to give it a trunk of oh, the dark, warm gray color. Oops, where's my drawing tool? Ah, man, man I created the um, color, and then I accidentally selected the green again. So there we go. But I need it bigger. Beautiful. That is an awesome tree. All right, so... But I just want to get it working. Yeah, the size is pretty darn accurate, I think. So we'll just put it right there, and then we will create another one every once in a while. But so that only one of them is ever on screen at a time. Uh -huh. And uh, that should do it for those. It should just function properly there on that layer. So that's all we need to do for those, aside from getting the nice art in eventually. But so now we should be getting really close to the functionality of the uh, scrolling and general player movement of the actual Amiga version. Yeah, that's looking extremely similar. And as I go and I perfect the screen window size and all that, then I'll make sure that everything is like dead on accurate. Um, I still need to lower this whole front layer a bit. I keep trying to exit out of it the, with the key commands that I use to exit out in Amos. Like I'm seeing these graphics and it's it's fooling my brain. I keep, I'm in autopilot and I keep trying to exit out of the game like it's the Amos version. Um, mm -hmm. So because I have every other layer locked and I'm in this layer, I can do control A to select everything. And then I can click on one of the selected things and then move everything down all at once. All right, and I'm just going to run again to quickly test. And that's much, much closer to what it's supposed to be. Uh, the back layer needs to be up higher, I can tell. I gave it too much. So I'm going to lock this, unlock background layer. And we're just going to move that up a lot. So that'll be prettier. So sorry, patrons, like, you know, this is, if you're not, if you don't care as much about the visual side of things and you care more about the, uh, the like, how you make games with Construct, then I might be boring you a little, just tweaking the position of things and stuff. But uh, like I said, I'm, I'm an artist, so I, I like to keep things fairly aesthetically pleasing as I go. Um, all right, so there's that, and then... Now what we're going to do is I'm going to quickly create a new lay, uh, layout. A and this layout is going to be called, so I'm right clicking on the folder for layouts. And I'm also going to add an event sheet for it. And this layout is going to be called Spriter because the player is going to be a Spriter object, even though we're doing like per frame pixel animating. I still pre-created a spider object earlier today to use for this so we can have collision boxes built right into the animations. Uh, it just makes things more convenient for us. Um, 
Corey and I both have years of experience working with uh, Spriter, so uh, it just makes things it makes the game development side of things faster. Uh, and then we can do the same thing with bosses. There'll be Spriter objects, so we can really um, have collision rectangles built right into them and stuff like that. Um, and then it's also faster to perfect the timing of an animation in Spriter than it is to use just like per frame sprites and hand type in the duration of each frame in Construct. So anyway, that's why we're going to be using Spriter. And then I'm going to more carefully name these event sheets so that things don't get confusing. So this event sheet will be called, right click, rename, uh, Game Play Event. And then this one will be called Spriter Events. And then the cool thing in Construct is that in the gameplay events, if I right click, uh, let me make sure I'm in gameplay events by double clicking. Yeah. So I can right click and I can choose include event sheet and I can actually include the other event sheet. Um, so now we're going to go back to the Spriter frame, which is empty. And now I need to find the um, the actual hero spriter file that I s saved out as both an SCON and an SCML uh, file. And I drag the SCML file in here. And it's going to ask me what event sheet uh, to create an event for in. And that's going to be spriter events. And it tells me it created an event in the event sheet. And it doesn't matter where their stuff is because the player never sees this layout. This is just the convenient lay layout that we're going to import all of our Spriter objects into, like the bosses and the player. Um, so now that that exists, uh, we are going to... And as you can see, there's one hero entity zero, box zero. This is the collision rectangle for the player um, so that he'll be able to get hit... Um, and then, uh, so now we're going to go into the actual gameplay events, and we're going to finally add our first actual line of code, so to speak, which are called events in Construct. And I'm going to choose System, um, at Start of Layout, I think it's called, uh, on Start of Layout. And we are going to create an object, uh, actually back, uh, where is this hero it's called. I'm going to click it and I'm going to, wait, that's not how you create it. I had it right the first time. System. Uh, now I'm having, yeah, create object. Okay, I was having a little brain fart there, forgetting how to do things. And we're going to create the uh, hero spriter object. We're going to create it in the FG layer. And we're going to make its position always the exact position of the player box so and we're making it the X and the Y so when we're creating our actual levels like you look at this level this is where the player starts so if I'm oops if I move that the um, if I if I move this then at the start of the layer the player uh, the layout the player would start here instead of here I assume that makes sense. Uh, or if I do this, he'll start by falling from the sky and landing on the ground. Um, so, but now we also need uh, another event that always, which is called every tick. And it's the same. It just looks better for the sake of visual logic to have it say every tick, but you literally could do this. And that means the same thing. Like if in any circumstance basically and what we're going to do is we're going to make the hero we're going to set its position to another object so it will always be in the same position as this rectangle uh, object does that make sense mm -hmm. all right so now i'm going to run the layout and what we should see if i didn't forget something is here we have the player which is a spider object and he's staying perfectly synchronized with the um, the collision box and um, so now 
Obviously, we need to hide the collision box. We need to make the character turn around when the player is moving the other way. And, um, and then we're going to make it play, display the actual appropriate animations. And if you want, we can stop at that point. Uh, I don't want to make this video too long. Okay, so now let's get this character turning around and uh, displaying the proper animations. Let's see if we can get that done. By the way, I also found the, uh, the resolution that I had scribbled down. So uh, maybe I'll do that too if things go quickly and then we'll end the video for uh, this month, the private video for this month. So now we need some more events. So we can simply, we can simply go, um, so now, oh, and uh, another thing I should point out to keep things organized and easy to understand, there are two things at our disposal. There's uh, commenting, so you can create comments, and there's um, uh, groups. So what I'm going to do right now is just add a uh, comment. Where is it? Add comment up top, and I'm going to say this event. Um, this event creates the player uh, spider object at start or level and then I think I can even just copy and paste that and then move it down here and say this event keeps the player spider object connected to the player box okay and then, so the other thing we can do is like, I can right click here and create a group and we'll call this group uh, player controls, uh, no, player uh, animation. And this will also include keeping them in the right position for the hell of it. It's a sensible place to put it. So then I just moved it in there. So then you can minimize groups. So when your code gets bigger, it's really important to have things well organized. Um, all right, so now we're going to add another event that says, what's the easiest way to deal with this here? Um, player box, for now we're just going to uh, compare, compare its X velocity. So um, I think I need this and we're going to compare two values and we're going to find the player box and then we're going to find its vector X. So if vector X I think by default, if I remember, the player is facing to the graphically facing the right, right? Uh -huh. So if f vector x is greater than zero, that means if it's moving to the right, then we're going to take the hero spider object and we're going to set whether or not it's flipped, which is where. Uh, Appearance, uh, no, it's not there. It's in here somewhere. It's been a while. Upset mirrored on X axis, and we say don't mirror because that's the way the graphic is already facing. And then we're going to create another event Control C, Control V. Uh, just copy it, and then we're going to uh, edit, and we're going to say is less than. So now it's moving to the left, and now we double click and we say we do want it mirrored. Right, so now, and then I can, hopefully without too much trouble, put that into the player group, the player animation group, save my progress, and run the layout, and now we should see the player, he's still not going to animate properly, but he turns to face the right direction. There we go. And you might notice there's a weird wobbliness that's happening for two reasons. I think this is running in... Firefox or some other browser I don't use much. Maybe I'm mistaken. Is that Chrome? But the other thing is the um, we're seeing a slight difference between the uh, the player box and the uh, the spider object catching up to it. But that that jiggly effect will disappear when we finally hide. So I'm going to make this um, player box invisible at start. 
and then uh, we since we don't need to see it anymore since we have the player sprite object uh, so now I'm going back to we don't need this either um, so now what we're gonna do is add some other stuff some other events that in this case we're gonna check is the player moving so we go to the platform movement stuff and we say is it moving and add another condition is it on the floor uh, let's see where is it um, oh here is on floor okay so if it's on the floor but it's moving then we want to change the hero's animation uh, let's see it should be up top somewhere set animation um, say animation and that is called walk I think I'll have to double check if it doesn't work and um, we're going to play from current time ratio um, all right that's fine for now uh, I think that'll work and then we're gonna copy this and we're gonna say if it's on the floor but it's not moving so I'm gonna negate this right so almost every sort of um, check for a state of something you can invert it and now it means is the opposite of that true so that means is it not moving but it's still on the floor and if that's the case we want to set its animation to idle and done so now it should at least while you're on the ground it should update properly to the idle animation which is static or walk nope it's got a problem I'll bet I named the animation walking instead of walk. So we'll just try changing this to walking and see if that fixes it. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on floor, yeah. This should work. And yet it does not. Hmm. It's not walk or walking, really. Let me load, look at the. Oh, good, I have it open. Oh, it's walk with a capital W. Uh, uh, K, it is case sensitive. All right. There we go. There we go. So his movement speed is obviously too fast for the walking animation speed, but that's a simple tweak that we'll worry about at a later date. And as you see, because he was jumping, like we didn't do the code for jumping yet, so we're going to do that next. But as you can see, like it's been a short amount of time. Like it took me a long time to get to this state in the Amos Amiga version. Uh, and, and you can see how fast it is to uh, get a 2D game working, uh, authoring it, authorize, no, authoring it and construct. Uh, all right, so now I might as well copy this yet again. And this time we're going to uh, say, um, I'm going to replace this. And there's actually a cool triggering thing where you can say, see here, animation triggers. So on mm -hmm. jump, which means as soon as the player initiates the jump, what we're going to do is we're going to change the animation to jump. And then we're going to do the same thing, but now we're going to um, on I think you, fall. Go ahead. I think you've got an I in there. Oh, yep. What's wrong with that? I jump. <laughs> uh, and then this is going to be I fall. Or maybe it's it, it jump. It jump, yeah. It, it jump. All right. Uh, so let's see what happens now. Yep, jumping and falling work, and walking and idle work. It's that easy, yet that complicated. Pretty sure that's a quote from Space Ghost Coast to Coast, by the way. <laughs> it's that easy and that complicated. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Space Ghost Coast to Coast. Uh, anyway, um... So, do you have the energy? Do you are you uh, too tired, or should I try to make it so he can do his attack as well? 
Uh, it's up to you. I mean, if you feel right. like... Cool. If you're not falling asleep in your chair uh, or on your keyboard, then let's do this one last thing, and then we'll wrap up the video for today. Um, okay. Or I should say the private video for this month. Um, nothing stopping us from doing additional videos, but it's already almost the end of the month, so most likely it'll be a non-private video will be the next video that we do. But anyway... So, uh, let's see. So here's where it gets a little tricky, and the, the way to handle this, you're already a game developer, Corey, so you already know what a state engine is, but for mm -hmm. anyone who's not a developer who might be listening, the uh, inside a game engine, you need to keep track of the state of an item or a character, the player or an enemy, and the simplest form of state engine that I love to use, like in Construct, you can click on any object and you can give it its own instant vari instance variables that it keeps track of. Um, and you can name them whatever you want. And I'm going to call this one stuck in move. And this is simply going to let the game engine keep track of whether or not a player is currently stuck in a situation where it shouldn't be able to do its normal animations. And you'll see how this logistically comes into play. And we'll keep it a numerical one. Uh, yeah, we'll keep it numerical. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another, let's see. In fact, I'll be fancier and I'm going to create a sub-event. So I'm going to add uh, no, insert new above, and we're going to do, we're going to compare that instance variable. So compare instance variable, stuck in move equals zero. So that means it's not stuck in a move. So all of this stuff should happen only if the player is not currently stuck in a move. All right? Huh? So when does a player get stuck in a move, right? So in this case, we're going to do, and for now I'm going to... Uh, set it up with, I have to double check and make sure uh, that I have the keyboard input object. Yes, I do. Apparently it automatically populates like uh, gamepad and keyboard and mouse control objects if you tell it you're making a retro game. So uh, like you normally mm -hmm. you might have to on, like double click somewhere in the canvas. Hold on, why isn't it working? Double click. Oh, I guess. Okay. No. Nope. Why isn't it working when I double click in the gray? That's weird. There we go. Uh, so you double click and then you have to add those things, but it automatically did it for me. Um, all right, so now we're going to go into the event sheet and we are going to say, for now, we're just going to map it to the A key. Um, A for attack. <laughs> uh, so we're going to say Perfect. keyboard, exactly. Uh, on a key pressed, let's see. Uh, on key pressed, and then you just click here and you press the A key. And we click done. So if a key is pressed and we're gonna make sure, actually, yeah, that should be in there too, but we're gonna copy and paste that in here. So if the player is not currently stuck in a move and the, the player presses the A key, then we are going to change the animation. So I'm just pasting that and quickly changing the name. Uh, to, did I call it punch? Let's see, let's, it's always good to keep your spider file open. K lower case P, punch. So. When you said that, I, it made me think of like a, like a wrestling move, like the donkey press. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so say animation to punch and really important we are going to also at the same exact instant uh or instance we're going to no instant yeah i don't know i i don't english well <laughs> like my i've been living in france for over 10 years and seriously my uh my english especially when i'm tired uh i have some real bad uh grammatical brain farts uh all right so we're going to set the value of stuck and move to one so now the game knows it is stuck in a move, right? So that means it won't automatically replace the punch animation that's trying to play with these animations. That's why we're checking to make sure it's not stuck in a move. 
and then as soon as you do something that's a special animation we that that's our state engine this variable that simply says hey wait you're stuck in a move don't just play the normal idle or the normal jump or fall and so on and so forth and mm -hmm. uh, anyway so that's how that works and then but we now we need to do something really important we need to unstick him once the animation is done so we go hero uh, there should be on animation finished and so we're going to make that say uh, punch so when the punch animation finishes and then we're going to copy and paste this and drag it right down and we're going to set it back to zero so that all should work fine presuming i didn't forget to make the punch animation non-looping in spriter so let's see i thought i clicked run layout i did okay so we can walk we can jump he can idle he can fall and now he can attack the animation plays a little too quickly but it works and you can even do it in the air because of the way I programmed it. Oh, there is one thing. Actually, I noticed a little glitch and I didn't know why. Do you see how we're setting the animation to punch, but we're doing it from the current time ratio? So mm -hmm. if it was like 80% along the timeline of walk, it would only show the end 20% of the punch. So uh, I, ne I need to use a different uh, play animation uh, version which is f play from the beginning so we're going to um, set animation to punch and make sure this is set to play from start okay and there we go so we're gonna save so the fun thing is next time not only will I set the resolution properly um, but we will actually add the first enemy that we have and make it so you can punch it and destroy it and then we'll probably add the actual we'll make the hud actually work so your health you'll be able to get hit by the enemy and you'll be able to destroy the enemy and earn points that'll be the goal for the next uh, time we can work on this so there it is i can walk i can oops pressing the wrong key i can punch there we go <clears throat> so I haven't perfected the timing of these animations in Spriter yet. I uh, just got it done really quick so we could get it all working. So, uh, But that's how easy it is with Construct. So next we'll actually get the HUD working for health, the score working, get in the basic enemy, and allow you to destroy the enemy. And the, yep, you know, I guess the advantage of using Spriter is you, know, you can tweak all the timing of those animations. Extremely easily. And then just re-import it. Uh, exactly, and it, and it just overrides everything. That's nice, right? And the same thing with like collision boxes and stuff like that. Like, oh, it's a little like it, it would feel better in the game if the collision box were a little bigger or a little taller. All of that sort of stuff is like built right into Spriter, and there's really Very cool, cool stuff for like um, in Spriter. Not only can you designate like, let's look at the punch animation when you get to the frame oh i didn't do it yet so this is great i'll actually show so by the time the actual attack frame shows up we need an attack box so we can literally and do i have the regular box i don't think i did so let me go back to idle and i'm going to copy that standard collision box and then i'm going to go back to uh, punch and on a control shift V to paste that so that's in all the frames so he's got the, his normal box and now we're going to add a second box right here for the attack so we are going to make it pretty you know uh, be a little lenient for the player give him a nice big attack box and we can even rename that to attack right so we've got an attack box and we're going to copy that and then in it should stay persistent uh yeah i think it will yeah it'll stay persistent until the next frame yeah let's be lenient for them and make it exist on the second frame of the attack as well there we go and then it disappears as it's supposed to in the end of the attack all right so there's the attack and i think i also forgot uh, to add that to like it's in the walk yeah it's not in the jump or the fall so I'm just going to do control V and control V and it looks like I have him needlessly too high in the jump like his feet should be off the ground but I have him too high up so I'll mm -hmm. just tweak that as well that's fine 
and then I'm gonna save that again uh, save project as and then hero and I have to save it out as the SEML and the scan save project as this is specific to um, uh, in construct save yes all right so I guess I'll re-import it while we're at it so the, and that's one of the other reasons I created a layer a layout specifically for spider objects because you always know where to import re-import all your all your spider objects so now I just drag this in and it knows it already exists so it says do you want to update it so yes spider events yes and the only thing I need to do now is go into the spider event sheets and delete the old version of the initialize event and now because uh, basically the API for plugins doesn't allow you to delete old events so it always has to create a new one so that's the only tricky aspect of a re-import but now you can see the attack box also exists mm -hmm. so we're going to save our progress and the next time we work on this we will do uh, making the making the enemy and making them each able to hurt each other and make the score work and the um, the hit points for the player work that'll be the goals for next time all right cool so as you can see the progress is really fast and very soon this is going to uh, we're going to need new art really quickly this way right mm -hmm. and we're going to be able to really perfect the design and then while I get the chance to work with Mike and uh, Mike Ness and while Mike Ness gets to work he'll have the exact guide of how things should behave that he can then copy the behavior and uh, so yeah and then hopefully like we're gonna be able to have a finished game via construct much sooner that we can release on the web and on tablets and stuff like that to hopefully generate some some interest and some uh, revenue which you know, the more money we make working on this, the more hours per day or week we can work on these projects instead of paying work, like from other, you know, we need to eat. So, um, <laughs> so hopefully we can, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's, uh, that's how that's all working. Thanks, uh, thanks patrons so much for your, uh, for your patronage. And uh, I hope this video was entertaining for you and uh, filled you back in on what's going on on the Amiga. And uh, again, I apologize for the silence. It was mostly forced. Not only was I really busy coordinating all this with all these other people, um, but a lot of it is just stuff they all currently want secret until they're ready to um, publicly tease their projects. So uh, anyway, so that's how everything's going. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Corey, for being a part of this video and for helping out. I can't wait to get the uh, additional art power on this project. And uh, uh, no it's, it's always a blast to, um, to uh, collaborate on a project and get it done all the sooner and at a higher quality than if you were doing it all yourself. So anyway, with that, I will stop the video. And uh, thanks again, patrons, very much for your support.